Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talk of the Town. Uh, this is James Milan, and we are with a familiar guest, our state rep, or one of the two state reps who share Arlington. Dave Rogers is joining us from his home, like everybody is, right? Um, and welcome, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Happy um, let's let's start just by asking the question that we are really interested in uh, first off with all of our guests, and that is, how are you doing? How are things going in your household and for you personally? Uh, well, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm doing fine. Uh, knock on wood. Uh, it's been a trying time for all of us, but uh, I have a big extended family, three brothers, three sisters, lots of nieces and nephews, and just a bunch of folks, but uh, so far, at least in my own family, we've been lucky that everyone is healthy. And um, uh, thanks for asking. How about you? How are, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Yeah, happily, uh, just just before all this hit, uh, moved my my uh, 84 year old mom down here from Western Canada, where she where she was for four decades. So the timing was was perfect to get her into moved into our house uh, back in January and much better for for her to be with us and us to be with her than than worrying about her her welfare so thanks for asking as well and uh yeah we're all we're all good we're feeling lucky uh within within this very very peculiar context that we find ourselves um speaking of which let's let's get to it i think uh, a lot of people are curious about this you are, as we know, a state legislator. There is a lot of stuff that needs to happen, that needs to come out uh, of, this, of the state house uh, for the benefit of Massachusetts residents right now. Um, you are likely as busy as you have ever been, I would imagine. How are you getting your work done? Well, uh, great question. And uh, it is a busy time and it's sort of um, all consuming. Because normally we have any, you know, dozens of different public policy questions in front of us. Now, really, the main thing is this pandemic, uh, the public health emergency that we all find ourselves in. And the legislature has already done a lot, and we will do more. Um, to give a couple examples, uh, one is uh, directly applicable to Arlington is town elections were supposed to take place in early April. Uh, but the law is such that if a town wanted to change its election date, would have to go to the judicial branch of government, would have to go to court. But we promptly passed a law that would empower uh, municipal governments uh, to change their election date without the need to go to court. And so Arlington did that. The select board moved the election date. Another example is, uh, obviously, Arlington has representative town meetings. Representative town meeting does a lot of things, but perhaps the biggest thing it does is approve the town budget. Mm -hmm. It will be done by June 30th, where representative town meeting, town meeting votes on the town budget. Well, there is, given the community distancing that we're all uh, living with, uh, there was no way it would seem to, to convene a town meeting. And there is no provision, or there was no provision in the law for Arlington to approve its town budget. So literally come the end of the fiscal year, there was no legal mechanism for Arlington to continue to spend money. So what we did is we passed a law in the state legislature that empowers towns to do a so-called one-twelfth budget, a monthly, month-to-month -month budget where you just sort of level fund services where they were uh, in the previous fiscal year. We got that through and it's been signed. So those are two examples of the town elections town meeting and approving the town budget where we needed to pass uh, legislation quickly to address those things. And we have a number of other uh, pieces of legislation. We just passed a bill that will uh, postpone MCATs this year. We heard from a lot of educators, uh, teachers, parents, uh, school administrators that um, right now, say school is able to return on May the 4th, and I think that's an open question. Let's say hypothetically for the purposes of our conversation, school could return. A lot of the learning that's taking place right now is pretty uneven. Kids with good technology at home who don't have English as a second language, who don't have any developmental disabilities, who maybe have folks who can pitch in and help them who aren't themselves frontline workers who can be home with the student. 
those students are probably going to do okay, even, even given this enormous disruption. But what about all the other students who are having an uneven learning process? And I think even for the students who do have all the advantages, it's still pretty uneven. So to ask them to come back and take this uh, important test this year would have been, uh, I think, unfair and unwise. So we just passed a law uh, to eliminate the MCATs requirement. So those are some things we've done, and, and there's a bunch of other stuff in, in, in the pipeline. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that we are curious about, though, is just a purely procedural question, which is uh, you were just mentioning several pieces of legislation that have been passed. How does that happen? Do you just uh, convene enough people via Zoom to have a quorum to be able to do, to pass those votes? Is that how that's happening? Yeah, it's such a great question. It's, it's an astute question because that is very much the challenge we face. And um, what we have done is the legislature meets primarily in two ways, an informal session and a formal session. Uh, a formal session is where all members are present. That is from the far western reaches of the state near the New York border, uh, all the way from the Cape and the islands. Legislators from all around the state are required to be physically present on the floor of the House and voting. And that's a more formal process. Amendments are offered and introduced and debated. And there's just a whole, it's a whole um, pretty rigorous process we go through. But the legislature also meets in what's called an informal session. And informal sessions, you know, it could be we're going to name a bridge. We're going to establish what's called a sick bank, which is when somebody, a state employee is ill and his, his or her co-workers want to donate some of their sick time, create a sick bank for all sorts of things like this that are more routine, we can do them in an informal session. Well, what we're doing now is passing some of these significant bills I just described in an informal session. And it's made for uh, some challenges for legislators to how do you file an amendment? How do you make sure to weigh in and protect the interests of your community as well as the broader public policy interests that you believe are in the best interests of of the whole state. And so uh, I, uh, in a formal session, I'm introducing amendments, I'm, I'm on the floor. I'm, um, at times, I have literally sent a text to the chair of Ways and Means where the bill is sitting in Ways and Means, or an email or a text to a senior staff person in the speaker's office to say, hey, I think this is important. Hey, I think this should be in the bill. And then, um, so I've been able to put my ideas forward, but it, it's, uh, it's unorthodox. And to compound that, the curiosity of timing right now is that April is budget month in the state house. The House of Representatives takes up the state yep. budget forty plus. We've talked to you about that in the past, that's for sure. Yeah, forty plus billion dollar budget, and the parliamentarians, the lawyers who uh, are, need to establish the process, have as of yet not done so. In other words, we still don't know how we're going to meet debate and approve our budget for our entire state. That is under discussion, under uh, <laughs> the midnight oil is being burned as, as many work to solve that riddle. Uh, and um, this, by the way, the same is true for town meeting in Belmont and Arlington. I've helped put forward language for remote participation. Mm -hmm. in those, so that Arlingtonians and Belmontians, uh, members of town meeting, can participate remotely you know perhaps in some combination of, of of methods including what we're doing right now with the zoom technology yeah i mean clearly obviously it goes without saying extraordinary times uh extraordinary measures are required and a lot of flexibility and a lot of people need to be willing to do something unorthodox uh, uh in order just to get the business done that needs doing. And that is nowhere more true uh, than in the context in which you work. That's for sure, because there are an awful lot of people depending on you guys being able to get these things done. However it is that you devise whatever by whatever method you devise to do so. Uh, right. So let's talk about that a little bit. Obviously, we know, and this, this is first and foremost, it remains first and foremost a public health crisis. Um, but I'd like to talk about both the public health piece and the economic 
ramification piece. Um, and, you know, and th there, are, there are many other facets as well. And those two clearly overlap in many ways. But um, if you can start off by just describing some of the work that you guys are doing right now, some of the programs that you've already, or, or the, the legislation you've already rolled out in order to enable us to more effectively address the public health crisis, and also what's, you know, what you're working on currently around that. Sure. Well, almost uh, right from the outset of this, uh, the House quickly passed uh, millions of dollars of aid for our local boards of health uh, and um, the State Department of Public Health to shore up those finances and inject money into the agencies and lo local and state agencies that will uh, be helping to coordinate the response. Um, a lot of the activity, of course, I'm sure you've been reading about and your viewers of uh, funneled through the, the governor's office on personal protective equipment, getting ventilators, getting other gear. Uh, I have had suppliers or people I know through my network reach out to me and I promptly put them in touch with the procurement officials in state government to try to help them uh, provide services uh, and equipment to the state. Um, and so it's, it's really um, all hands on deck right now. Uh, a lot of, in a public health emergency, you know, the legislative process is a deliberative process. Mm -hmm. Each, the House and the Senate, weighing in uh, the pros and cons of any particular piece of legislation. And to really craft sensible law takes time. And time is not a luxury you have in a public health emergency. So a lot of the key actions designed to contain and overcome uh, the crisis in the public health sector is, by necessity, must come out of the governor's office. They have emergency power to just literally, as you've seen, issue orders mm -hmm. and order closing the schools and order closing all non-essential businesses. So. Um, I think it's important to remember a lot of what I've done is to work with our attorney general and work with our governor's office to advance ideas that I think will be helpful. And uh, give you a specific example. I, yeah, great. right at the very beginning of this, I went shopping, went food shopping. And I was, I got to tell you, alarmed at how, uh, you know, they, these were essential businesses and one of the few places where Keep in mind, there's an order saying no more than 10 shall gather. But supermarkets are one of the places where that rule is, is right. not observed because you have people streaming in to get their groceries. Moreover, the grocery stores are limiting their hours. So it's one of the few places people can go. It's essential. They need food. And they've limited their hours of availability. And what it meant is crowd. What I noticed the very first time I went is crowding. I promptly came back from the store and sent uh, messages to the speaker's office, to the chief of staff there, to say, you know, here's a series of things I recommend we do with the supermarkets. And then I saw that Attorney General Maura Healy was developing regulations for our supermarket. And I've developed a relationship with her where I was literally texting Maura with ideas of what I thought needed to happen in our supermarkets. So um, a big part of what I'm doing as a legislator now is not traditional legislating. It's interacting with the executive branch to push for things that I think could be helpful. I'll give you another example. I had an, I've had many constituents reach out with challenges with getting their unemployment claims filed. As you see, we have record unemployment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that suddenly spiked. I mean, to get 17 million claims of coordination in three weeks and hundreds of thousands here. So, uh, I'm getting a lot of inquiries about unemployment, and I noticed uh, one constituent uh, was asked to print out and sign a form and send it back in, and this constituent did not have a printer. Well, guess what? There are a lot of low-income folks who have technological challenges. They don't have a printer, and I even did a survey with some friends of mine. Do you have a good, well-functioning printer at home right now? And I was surprised the number of people who don't. So I got in touch with the governor's office, and I said, you know, in the business world now, electronic signatures and you know you attest under penalties of perjury that the information you have provided is true and accurate 
you do it all over the computer. We have electronic signatures, electronic submission. So I said, if it's not in the system already, you should have your software programmer just code in a simple electronic signature. And so that idea, I, I just sent that to them within the last couple of days, but I plan to follow up later today mm -hmm. to see, you know, um, uh, if that's an yeah. idea. Yeah, listening, listening to you just describe how those things are, are unfolding um, in the current environment makes me wonder, you know, we've talked to others in other fields about the fact that they are pretty sure, they don't know exactly what form it will take, but they're pretty sure that business as usual in whatever it is that they do will be fundamentally different um, on the other side of this, partly right. because of just the general changes that this is going to make to how we see uh, the way that we do things, but also because changes that they've had to make in this current situation um, seem like th they should be incorporated into how they uh, proceed once we return to normal. Um, right. I'm wondering, you know, if you have any examples that you would, uh, that you would offer up for the work that you and your fellow legislators do, um, that you're, you're, you're finding, oh, this could work quite well, and maybe we should do, th do things this way, or at least incorporate this as we move forward. Well, one is an example I just gave you, even when we pull out of the crisis, I think uh, there's no reason uh, those applying for unemployment, for instance, shouldn't be able to do simple electronic signatures. They're accepted in the business world for transactions in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. It's called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. I think all 50 states have adopted it. Uh, you don't need um, a hard copy signature on most. There are a few documents you might, but very few that you do. Um, so that, that's one example. And I think others will be revealed over time uh, in terms of specific techniques. Uh, but your question also touches on a broader thing, not so much specific yep, right. pinpointed procedural items, but um, this crisis has laid bare some deep fissures in our healthcare system and in our society writ large. And we're still in the midst of the crisis. We haven't even reached our peak. As we're told here in Massachusetts, the epidemiologists and public health experts are graphing out uh, what they believe is the likely trajectory of, of the, the virus, but uh, it's still not too soon to at least begin to think about um, what changes we need to see in our society as a whole uh, that have been revealed by this crisis. Uh, because um, here, in what is still, even with the rise of China, the wealthiest country in the world, I think many of us. Uh, if we weren't before, are really awakened to the fact of some of the, the inequities and inefficiencies in our systems. And so, um, yeah, that's that is truer words uh, cannot be spoken really at this time. Um, everything about this pandemic, in many ways, is uh, we have found through our own experience and and reading and also talking to others. Uh, it is exacerbating the existing inequities and the systemic uh, issues, as you say, have been laid bare, the systemic changes that need to take place in order for this to be uh, a truly fairer and more equitable society for more of its members. Um, again, this has been, this has, has brought that, a, a bright light to that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how you feel about the prospect of that uh, leading to real change on the other side of all of this, uh, given humans' I, tendency and Americans' tendency. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I feel a lot better about the prospect of that if we defeat Donald Trump in November. Sorry for being so blunt. No. I really see, and I realize this is a community program, I don't want to make this too political, but. Um, you know, I took a class in, in college called News of the Day. It was a history class. Now, you might say to yourself, well, if it's news of today or news of the day, how could it be about history? But what we did is we took the headlines of today and then traced back decades back to draw an arc 
between what is in the headline of the newspaper of reading online today and, and what has happened in the past. And I, I have to say one recurring thought I've had, and I've thought this a lot during this crisis, is we are seeing laid bare the manifestation of a decades-long philosophy by one group of folks in our country, one party, that thinks government would screw up a two-car parade. And what they've done, well, that's kind of funny, right? But what they've done is systematically denigrated and criticized and um, underfunded government. And I think in a crisis, who's coming to everyone's rescue right now? The government, a $2.2 trillion bailout for struggling people, for unemployment, for those desperately in need. Where? Out of the U.S. Congress, out of the government. Well, why has the Center for Disease Control not been adequately funded? Why has the National Institutes of Health not been adequately funded and cut? Meanwhile, we're cutting taxes on the wealthiest folks in the country. I don't begrudge uh, well-off folks their money. Mm -hmm. But when you have critical public health care infrastructure underfunded, when you have countless needs of the society underfunded and a lack of investment in, in these critical needs, um, I think this crisis has revealed the manifestation of that ideology, of that philosophy, which we could go back decades, um, you know, and um, I really, I really hope that among other things that come out of this is, look, governments doesn't know how to have every answer for every solution, I mean, every solution for every problem. We need a thriving vibrant private sector, the innovation, the dynamism, the entrepreneurialism that, that creates uh, new technologies. And, and that's important. You must have a thriving, bustling private sector. But that same thriving, bustling um, energy uh, has to animate our public institution. And we have to attract the best and the brightest and invest deeply in innovating in the public sector, too. And that is where I think we're seeing right now th that hasn't happened adequately in our society. And it's leading to calamitous outcomes. And I, I really hope as we look forward three, five, seven, 10, 15, 20 years, that this has awakened Americans to how important the functions of the public sector are. Well, let us, let us hope so. Let us hope that there are lessons there and in other areas that people will draw on to actually make things better, not just to survive what we're dealing with here, uh, but to somehow um, be able, again, to address what we have always thought of as normal life in a way that better serves uh, more sectors of the population. Uh, you know, I think we, well, I think all of us, uh, attending to this program <laughs> probably uh, are, are, are in agreement around that. Let me ask you a couple more mundane questions now. Um, one is, uh, describe a little bit about what your day-to-day -day life is as a legislator here. Are you maintaining office hours, for instance? H how is it that, again, you yourself, uh, Dave Rogers, you are conducting business. You, you've explained how the body, the collective bodies, co you know, uh, conducting business. How about you? Yeah. So I'm getting a lot of emails from constituents. I'm responding personally to each and every one of them. Uh, I'm uh, getting phone calls and texts from constituents. I'm responding personally to all of them. Uh, we have people in, I have a staff at the state house and I've instructed them as I always do, but even more so now, uh, what rockets to the top of my list is an individual or a family in need. Now, no matter what bigger picture things I'm working on, like climate change legislation or criminal justice reform legislation, what zooms to the top right now is if I get a phone call, if somebody says I'm legitimately entitled to unemployment assistance, I've been laid off, I filed a claim, I haven't heard back from DUA, the Department of Unemployment Assistance. I drop everything, and that's first. So human need in a crisis comes first, and that's where a lot of my time is gone. Uh, beyond that, uh, staying in touch with constituents by, again, answering emails, phone calls, calling people to 
uh, address their concerns. Uh, I am uh, with our um, older residents who, you know, maybe are in a more high risk group, kind of just uh, trying to set a aside a little time every other day just to call some folks and check in mm -hmm. on them. Good. I'm, you know, volunteering in Arlington and Belmont on various local community things to deliver meals, to um, uh, deliver other services. Uh, I am working on legislation, some of this legislation I described at the top of the program. And I'm doing the communications. I was just on a Zoom call earlier today with Arlingtonians who are a part of the uh, UU, the Unitarian Universalist Activist Group that is uh, keenly interested in a lot of different social justice issues. They wanted to talk to me about what state government's doing to respond. So I just had a half hour Zoom call earlier with some Arlingtonian activists. I'm doing a teletown hall um, uh, Thursday <clears throat> with uh, the other part of my district, um, uh, Belmont. Mm -hmm. Senator Berger and I are hosting a teletown hall where we'll be taking questions and, and lots of other things. Like I mentioned, like what I saw a need at supermarkets and, and more social distancing regulations to kind of create um, a safer space. So I'm, I'm texting other state leaders with ideas, suggestions, see how I can help. We have a vulnerable populations in our prisons right now. I've been working on that issue of can we get folks who aren't dangerous, obviously you're not gonna release dangerous individuals, but folks who are wrapping their sentence, folks who are um, uh, not a threat, to get them out to prevent overcrowding and we don't want uh, huge outbreaks in our prisons. So um, that gives you a flavor or a sense of, of yeah. what I'm, uh, it's pretty nonstop, um, it's demanding, but as I've said uh, uh, to someone else just the other day, as terrible as this is and as traumatic and stressful, it gives those of us who have a calling to do this work, who are called to public service, an opportunity to step up and really try to uh, deliver services and deliver results. So um, it, is, it is an opportunity for me to, to really help people. And, and, and as bad as this situation is, that is rewarding to have that chance, to have that opportunity. And I believe uh, that I've been able to do so. Especially because we've often talked to you in the past, uh, in, in past conversations, the, a lot of the themes that you've touched on here are, are ones and, your, and commitments that you have espoused in the past are ones that you've consistently uh, followed through on over the years. But I know that you also have, uh, you know, alluded at various times in previous conversations to the fact that the work that you're doing, it is not only deliberative um, and takes time, et cetera, but it is at a step removed or sometimes more than that from the people who ultimately will be served by it. Um, and you're not always dealing so directly. Uh, uh, you always deal, I know, with your constituents, et cetera, but not always in, in such a, I don't know, I, I, again, I, I would imagine fulfilling for you way uh, in which you are meeting needs and providing services and things like that. Yes, uh, that's right. It's Sorry. a crisis, and if you can uh, help someone uh, who's on the, frankly, on the knife's edge of survival in terms of financial survival, uh, if you can get them uh, the coverage they need, the help they need, whether it's mass health or supplemental nutrition assistance or unemployment, that is rewarding, and it's um, you know a big part of the reason I do this work. It's called public service for a reason. You want to serve the public, and you want to uh, help people, uh, particularly at times like these. On on that note, um, just I'm sure that it is not hard at all for people to contact you, as you're saying that that your constituents do each day. But let's go ahead and, and ask you, uh, you know, what is the phone number for for your office? What is the email through which they they can most easily access you? Excuse me. Sure. Well, ever since uh, I've been doing this job, I uh, list my personal cell phone. And uh, so why don't we start with that? And that's 617-817-9395. Matter of fact, if you have the ability to scroll um, uh, on your show, uh, when we, this is we will be able to add that in, yeah. My cell phone, 617-817-9395. And the number at the State House, which is programmed now to ring back out to either me or a member of my staff, is 617 722 
2637. I hope you can scroll that along the bottom of the screen or wherever as well. And then email, excuse me, is Dave, D A V E dot Rogers, R O G E R S at M A House, M A H O U S E dot gov. That's dot G O V. Perfect. Someone will get back to you very quickly. And I, I should say, whether it's you, a family member, a friend, a neighbor, anyone in need, you have any questions, you have concerns, you have ideas that you want to get to the governor. You have an idea that you'd like to share with, you've seen something that you think could be done better during this crisis. Text me, call me, email me. We'll, 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 we'll uh, funnel your idea up to the governor's staff. Um, whatever it may be, I'm here to help. My staff is here to help, and uh, we're ready, willing, and, and uh, eager to be helpful. You know, we are very mindful of your time and even more so uh, after you described what your what your days uh, are looking like, lo looking like and filled with. Uh, but I do want to ask you just a, a, a series of, a, about a series of, of different issues and just get some some short responses. Number one, um, the a lot of what you are needing to do is not only ease procedures um, ex and, and requirements and things like that to be able to bring more, uh, you know, just more resources to bear on this, but also money, right? Money is, 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 is huge um, in this, in this whole thing. Uh, is the state, uh, is, is the state tapping into the rainy day fund? Um, where is money coming from to provide uh, some of the programs and assistance that you guys are, 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 car, are, are crafting? Sure. Well, revenues last month actually were, it was before the, the impact of, of, of the virus. And so they were actually relatively stable. But starting now and going forward, each month's receipts, are expected to plummet and probably rather precipitously. Um, it's funny, in a way, town governments are more insulated than state government because town governments like Arlington and Belmont, two of the towns I represent, are dependent largely on property taxes. Well, the property <laughs> oh, yes. tax, even in a recession, the property tax essentially remains the same. But state government, our budget, is very much dependent on revenues that fluctuate significantly during economic downturn, the income tax, the sales tax, and so forth. So state government, and state government, unlike the federal government, which you're seeing these rescue packages, which are put on a credit card, basically. They're, de they're allowed to deficit spend, mm -hmm. issue bills, treasury bonds. State government can't do that. We have to balance our budget. So we're going to be seeing declining revenue, and we must have a balanced budget. So as, as a consequence, um, you know, we're going to be fighting just to level fund uh, programs, and, and some number of programs will be cut. Um, so, uh, the rainy, but to get to your question about the rainy day fund, it's sometimes called the stabilization fund. That has about three and a half to $3.6 billion. We have the third largest rainy day fund uh, of any state in the country. Alaska's first because of oil revenue, Alaska always has the biggest one. Matter of fact, I think Alaskans get a dividend. That's their right. State. I do remember hearing that, yeah. But even though we have the third largest, it really is not nearly adequate to meet the need uh, because the state budget is 40 plus billion dollars and our rainy day fund is only about three and a half. So, you know, that's um, maybe no, one be one twelfth of the state budget, enough to fund a month of state government. So now we can and will use the state government uh, stabilization fund, the rainy, done, rainy day fund, to meet critical needs. It's good that we have it, uh, but um, that's why you really need to see some of these uh, federal rescue packages. And there's been legislation filed to kind of do similar things at the state level of, of direct cash payments to families and and. Look, if the money is there, I'm all for doing everything we can possibly do. But um, I think there's one bill that would give $500 or $1,000 to every family. Well, you don't have to take long to pull out a calculator. And you know, we have 6.7, 6.8 million people in the state, and $1,000 um, know, per family. Um, you're talking about billions of dollars. That one bill alone would probably chew up the entire rainy day fund. 
So I've gotten calls, will you support this bill? I, look, I want to support it. I, I will fight for it, but I've got to tell you, we don't have the resources at the state level, which is why so much of this has to be done by the federal government. One of the great untold stories of the Great Recession of 2008, 2009, and what made that recession much deeper is that state governments had to lay off a lot of workers, state governments, and the federal uh, rescue packages didn't do nearly enough to shore up the finances of the states. And that's a big part of what exacerbated the Great Recession of over a decade ago. And certainly the signs are that that's, that, that is, you know, the, the federal government's not going to um, be doing, I assume, any more for the states uh, in this case uh, than they did at that time. I, I don't know. I don't have a good understanding of what this 2.2 trillion, for instance, uh, excuse me, uh, this 2.2 trillion, how much of that is actually going uh, to states uh, as states to decide how to then, you know, pass that money on to their citizenry or what? Not nearly enough. A lot of that was for unemployment, which is so important, and expanded unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that uh, was for loans to business to help out businesses that are struggling, both good things, uh, aid to hospitals. You know, our healthcare system in Massachusetts is hemorrhaging money because hospitals to clear out the capacity to meet the needs of a potential surge in coronavirus patients have canceled all elective surgery. Mm -hmm. And we think of these huge institutions that they, they must be so wealthy and uh, like uh, the partners hospitals, Beth Israel or Brigham, Mass General. But in fact, what we found is the minute they canceled elective surgery, they're hemorrhaging hundreds of millions of dollars a month. And they are uh, really um, in some trouble. Mm. Hard to think of these venerable, these you know, venerated uh, institutions that are world famous for sort of the most elite medicine, maybe in the world, um, uh, kind of buckling under the financial pressure. But it's a real problem in our uh, our safe safety net hospitals and community hospitals are having <clears throat> similar challenges, although not maybe quite as much as the bigger ones because they don't have as many of these elective surgeries. Right. Um, so, um, you know, it, it is a difficult financial predicament for the state to be in, and as ways and means, and the members write the budget this year is going to be some 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 big challenges we have to face. Yeah. So very quickly, um, we won't touch too much on climate change other than to say uh, that if there's any good that's coming from this, perhaps we're seeing some signs uh, in terms of, you know, environmental recovery uh, in a short in a short space of time uh, from basically shutting, you know, humans, human transport, basically. And and uh, and, you know polluting vehicles and, and polluting factories, et cetera. You know, it's, it's been, there's some remarkable statistics out there about the changes and improvements, uh, let's hope more than temporary, in people's uh, environmental conditions. Um, I, I, I invite you to, to, to add to that, but I also just want to ask you about one other point uh, that is, I know, of major concern to you from previous conversations, and that is, what are the ramifications of this for uh, efforts at criminal, ongoing efforts at criminal justice reform? Um, are all those things kind of being tabled for the moment? Uh, just address those two, uh, if you can, please. Sure. Well, we had a conference call with all the members, all the Democratic members in the House about um, the situation we're in. and. Uh, a discussion ensued about so many things, but one of them is what about, yes, we're all caught in this crisis now, we have to throw everything we have at it and use all the skill and um, abilities we can bring to bear to help, help people at this challenging time, but what about all the other priorities of society? Uh, climate change issues, criminal justice issues, countless issues, and there was a consensus, including from the folks in leadership on the call that while we want to tackle this crisis full on, that we don't want a year and a half of legislative work that stretches back to January of last year to uh, go for naught. So there's a real appetite to continue to press forward on 
some of the bigger uh, challenges that we, we face as a society, including uh, climate specifically came up. And I think there's a, an appetite uh, to do something this session on climate change. Uh, to your question about criminal justice reform. Now, we did a massive, a sweeping criminal justice reform uh, last session, which was hailed really around the country as a model. Uh, and touched almost every section of our criminal justice system. Um, but there's still more to be done. The big criminal justice issue, though, right now in the crisis is what to do about prison population. Mm -hmm. And our uh, district attorney here in Middlesex, uh, Marion Ryan, had begun to release certain uh, people who were held pre-trial, and they hadn't even been convicted of anything, right? They're being held pre-trial. They're innocent until proven guilty but uh, maybe couldn't make bail or, or held there. So she began to release people. Then there was litigation that went all the way to our state Supreme Judicial Court and the state Supreme Judicial Court ruled that those held pre-trial, the coronavirus essentially was a new bail, a new issue to be brought up at the bail hearing and that they could go petition the court and say, look, this is a so-called changed condition and therefore, and I'd be released. And, and many now are getting re released. The Supreme Court of our state set out a, Test where there's a rebuttable presumption that they should be released. Now the district attorneys can intervene at the hearing and say, well, this particular individual, there's extenuating circumstances. But otherwise, the presumption is for those held pretrial, except for those accused of really violent crime, mm -hmm. should be released. That brings up the question, though, of those who are not held pretrial, who've been tried, convicted, and sentenced to state prison, and their efforts now to try to get the one, those who are not violent, released because we don't want overcrowded prisons and an outbreak in our houses of correction or our prisons. That's, some, that's an issue I've been working on with Prisoners Legal Services, a really great organization here in the state, and also the ACLU, uh, partnering with them to work on that issue. I feel like uh, wherever we stop this conversation and we're about to, it's going to feel abrupt because there's so much um, you know, more to cover and so much more of your own uh, information and experience that you are working in with uh, every day that we'd like to tap into. I guess we're going to need to table that uh, for future conversations, though. Uh, as a last thing, I would just invite you, um, if you have something that you would like to say to the community, um, uh, that either is something that we have not yet covered um, in this conversation or just in your own words, uh, something that you would like to, to share or a message that you have. Um, I'd invite you to, to share that with us now. Sure. Well, I think my main message is uh, we're going to get through this. It's a tough, difficult, challenging time. Uh, it's been wrenching at times. I have had uh, uh, folks in the community I represent who have, who have died from this disease. Um, and so I, I don't for a minute downplay um, the seriousness of the situation. But I also know we're a resilient people. Um, we have a lot of uh, people working hard on the front lines, uh, healthcare professionals um, who are combating this. Uh, we in state government, I believe, are rising to the occasion to do everything we can to bring every resource to bear. And so I would say to folks, hang in there. We will get through this. And as I stated earlier, if, if I can be helpful in any way to you, a friend, a family member, a neighbor, uh, I think, uh, James, you're going to be displaying my contact information. I'll say my cell phone again, 617-817-9395. Get in touch. Happy to help. And uh, we will persevere and, and get through this and hopefully come out stronger. And uh, with that, we will let you get back to what I'm sure is a packed schedule for today and every day. We appreciate the work that you're doing on behalf of your constituents and all of us. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. Maybe, who knows, maybe next time we talk, it'll be back uh, in our studio again. Or if not, we'll see you right here and, uh, and get further updates on, on progress made at the state house level. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. And stay appreciate healthy. That. Sorry, go ahead, Steve. But stay healthy. But, all right. And with that, uh, for state rep, Dave Rogers. I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We appreciate you being here. Stay healthy, as Dave says. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.